like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture, and I'd especially like to welcome Vincent Kling, who's back with us for the second time in Muncie, and we're very, very happy to have him here. He asked me not to say anything in this introduction, but there are a few things that I'd like to say because I'm, I'm sure he's not going to mention these things. Uh, the first is that when, when Vincent Kling started out um, to practice architecture, he wasn't trying to have one of the country's largest architectural firms that uh, was capable of producing very high quality work. He was simply trying to do good architecture and good design. Uh, it turned out that he's managed to do both. Uh, his firm, which has received over 150 awards for its designs, uh, has done projects of all types, ranging from college campuses, churches, office towers, civic centers, projects from $200,000 to $300 million. And altogether, the value of these projects exceeds $1.5 billion. Uh, his office is set in, up in, in five studios, and the studios, uh, um, the, part, the, the people in each one of these studios begins a project with a client and carries it all the way through to the point where uh, the building is occupied with the same people working on that project. Uh, this particular approach, uh, begun by uh, Mr. Kling, is, is probably um, uh, very successful in that it achieved for his office a number of AIA National Honor Awards for the Lankana Hospital in Philadelphia, for the Westinghouse Molecular Electronics Laboratory in Maryland, for a dining hall at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, for the Municipal Services Building in Philadelphia, for a cafeteria for Monsanto, a chemical company in St. Louis. And these 150 honors have come from uh, a firm that um, started out with a beach house for a project. His first project was a beach house in Manilokin, New Jersey which was exhibited at the, at the, at the um, Museum of Modern Art in a show on contemporary American architecture. Mr. Kling's firm has been the consulting architect for the city of uh, Philadelphia for their Penn Center project, and a number of the buildings in that project, which is a multi-block project in the center of Philadelphia, have been done by uh, his office. His work extends outside the bounds of the United States, and he recently did uh, an embassy in Quito, Ecuador. His current projects include a health center for the University of Connecticut, Bell Telephones Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, headquarters building for DuPont in Delaware, and the new Philadelphia International Airport. He's a graduate of Columbia University, and he got a master's from MIT. He's a member of the College of Fellows of the AIA, he's a trustee, or has been for several years, a trustee of Columbia University associate trustee of the University of Pennsylvania, where he also serves as a, um, executive architect for the University of Pennsylvania. And he's recently been appointed consulting architect to the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, a board of directors. He told me that his office is only uh, down to 200 people. At one time, it had 500 people in it, and it was one of the largest, I think you said, the second largest in the United States. Uh, he also mentioned that 50% of the people in his office are architects. Um, the others are involved in law, quality control, uh, related disciplines to architecture, and I think that's worth mentioning. And I also over overheard him mention uh, to somebody at dinner that his father wanted him to be a doctor, is that right? And sent him to medical school for two years, and then he switched over into architecture. And I think uh, you'd all agree that having made the change, he's acclimated himself very well, and he's become relatively successful in spite of the fact that he made that switch. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have him with us here in Muncie, and he's going to, the name of his talk is A Bicentennial Look Backwards and a Few Predictions for the Century Ahead, Vincent Kling. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be invited to come back a second time and talk to the students, some of the faculty here. And I should try to make it worth your while. I have some things on my mind that uh, I would like to put out for your consideration. 
and I hope we have time to have a little exchange when this is finished. I have witnessed almost 28 years of the practice of architecture. I missed the first five and a half years by an interesting experience for the Naval Air Force. And I didn't draw a line or see a building or do anything about architecture from the day I got my degree at MIT until almost five years later. And maybe that's why I rushed and worked at it a little bit harder than most. I hated to waste those five years. But in, in the last 25 or 27, I have seen not only the most fascinating opportunity for design and innovative thinking and just plain fun, but I've also seen in the last few years quite a change in what presents itself to the young architect, the young planner, as he acquires his education and then steps out into the real world to do something with it. As I witnessed the transition from what we had in the way of a marvelous green field of post-war opportunity, just imagine almost six years of no building, enormous amount of desire on the part of everybody to catch up and rebuild, build things that were considered to be vital to the growth of the country. That and then saw the transition to the last five years. It seems to me it's been quite a full turnaround the cycle. In the wonderful days of designing buildings and then getting the full joy of seeing them built and having that as your principal interest, your principal goal, and principal requirement. Now, what has happened? Well, I'd say the genesis of today's situation which is uh, probably more acutely felt east of here, and then probably a little more again felt on the Pacific coast. The genesis of it, first of all, is the slowing down of the birth rate. There are fewer people. There were days in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the beginning of this year when more people died than were born. Remarkable switch. Well, that's the big post-war second generation baby boom that's going to come in the third generation in about 10 years, and the boom will come again. Maybe so, but statistics don't indicate that that same rate of growth in people will recur. Now, this is uh, revealed in the normal image that the architect Flex. You know, we're just great big mirrors. We don't go out and create society. It's there, and we reflect it. We try to be pretty choosy sometimes of what parts of it we reflect, but in a, inevitably, we do reflect the true world out there. We influence it. We try to change it. We have our ideals, which we try to superimpose on it. But usually, the true world has the upper hand. And so, the no growth status, which we see now, is resulting in not too extensive an opportunity for every graduate to find his niche in that beautiful world of the mother art known as architecture. Another thing has reared its head in the past few years, which will have much more to say about the look of new America than these two things I've just mentioned, and that is shortage of conventional energy. And so we now find ourselves facing terrifying demand on our ingenuity to design buildings that don't consume so much electricity and so much oil and so much coal and so much energy. And I'll talk about that in great depth. Another thing that has happened to change the general opportunity of the architect and the attitude of society towards what we do is pollution. Ecology, conservation. We just can't continue to waste our resources and 
let them flow in the air and precipitate all over the place and in the process pollute us uh, and our waterways infinitely and indefinitely. There's a big stop on this. And what man hadn't done out of his own morality, he'd done through his legislators, and there's a very tough law out there. If you just try to build a house out in suburbia where you can't tie into a sewer and where you can't percolate in the ground so many gallons per minute, according to the local zoning, you won't build a house. I'm sorry, you can have the most beautiful piece of land in the world. You can't use it. You're going to pollute the land. You're going to overload the ground. I'm sorry, you can't use the land. There are whole sections of America that are being uh, held in abeyance as far as use because of it. This is the genesis of the situation. Uh, then, of course, the big thing is the change in values. Uh, I guess we all have caught some of the so-called Madison Avenue disease when the uh, comfortable things that we could collect and bring to our own little nest were the vital things. And there's still a pretty strong tendency in this country. But I think there's a change in this. I think the young people have established some new values which don't necessarily demand an exorbitant use of our resources. Manifestations of this genesis what are they? Well, it's very little building. Somebody mentioned it. Then there's only one new high-rise building being built on the island of Manhattan today. Isn't that fantastic? After they led the world in building skyscrapers until they built those two big towers downtown, World Trade Center. There is a very definite change in the look of buildings due to the energy shortage. I'm afraid the Pittsburgh Blake Plate Glass Company is going to have a hard time now because we just can't use that much glass. We can't waste that much energy. And this will change the look of buildings. The old glass buildings, I think, even if they're triple glazed, or unless you would accept all of them reflecting the world as these mirror buildings do, they're pretty efficient at kicking off the energy, but they're pretty deadly as a total complex of buildings frightened me to death to think of a whole city built of mirror glass that would look like the worst ghost town in the world. That's the only way I can have that they've discovered to use that much glass and still not let all the energy flow. But there will be a change in the look that comes out of this. More conservative use of glass and these very light, almost brittle buildings which look so delicate that they hardly would support a good puff of wind are doomed for extinction because those buildings transmit so much energy. We're going to have to go to a much more efficient uh, building system. This is going to be a manifestation of these conditions I mentioned. Now there's another manifestation as uh, we have become, uh, and I forgot to mention this is the genesis. The genesis of the problem is that we are no longer competitive with the two leading industrial nations of the world and two more coming up behind them which are really going to box our ears in whenever China gets all those people going strong and when Russia gets it co collaborated they're going to be as formidable a competitor to us in the world markets as Japan and West Germany now are and believe me, one of the reasons that our growth has slowed down is because they are competing with us in steel and fabrics and electronics and automobiles, airplanes, anything you mention is being produced by these people at a very high level of quality and for far fewer man hours. Now, of course, the man hours today aren't as expensive per unit as ours they will come up, but their efficiency is great. Somebody says because they've got brand new plants, they're all bombed out during the war, what the heck, they got all brand new plants? They ought to be the most efficient producers. But there's an attitude there that is more basic than the umbrella. And this, uh, this 
lack of growth, which we're witnessing in industry, is in a great measure because we're not so competitive as we were 15 and 20 years ago. So when you go out in the real world, you're going to face this one. We always had a dozen large industrial clients doing something. Warehousing, manufacturing, even researching. And uh, these people have pulled in their their horns a bit and are looking around to see what will happen next. Manifestation. Some buildings, in order to exist, have had to be conceived on the absolute bare bones minimum budget and built at the raciest pace possible to keep ahead of inflation and peg themselves into marketability at this time. Just imagine the buildings that I did in Philadelphia 10 years ago that rented for seven or eight dollars a foot, having to be built now in 1976 to rent for that same unit. It's impossible. Those qualities cannot be met today unless we really make some innovative and some very dynamic changes in how we design. That brings me to my favorite subject. We've spent a whole evening on that, and that is the fact that the building industry in this country, which is the biggest one in the world, is supported by the absolute lightest, rather inadequate research backup of any of our industries. I do my own research. I build a building, I'll go back and find out whether it works. Nobody can tell me what my building will do. Look at Yao Ming Pei's problems in Boston. You would think in 1976 you could forecast some of these events. So if you do, uh, if you do your research, you still do it pretty much by yourself. The American Institute of Architects is just dabbling at it, in my opinion. This research foundation they started is not doing anything that they should and could. So the manifestation is we really aren't as efficient and as effective in the conservation of our resources in the building of our new work. What kind of a research program do you have here at Ball State on buildings? You have a great big casting bed shed yard out here. Does industry come up here and support you at the X rate billions of dollars a year to do the research that's necessary for our work? We do it. We did a little bit at MIT, but it was plenty little. It was disgracefully small. And Columbia is practically non-existent. Uh, it's just tragic that we can't get the principal producers of building materials to fund their research to the neutral station of a university and really do it, or let the institute do it. The institute is impecunious, so it doesn't do it. So there is the manifestation of the race, the lack of uh, conservation of our energies and what we find now is the demand that does exist is not being met by the most logical energy conservative designs much less the most efficient systems of building and I'm going to talk about system building because this is my favorite where do we go from here? Uh, <clears throat> I think in order for you to be requited by this great art which you're learning, you've got to build. I'm sorry if you don't build, you don't deserve the name architect. If what you design never gets built, you are a dilettante. And my description of a successful architect is the guy that gets something built, because from building you learn, and from building you grow, and from building you get a requitement that refires your boilers for the next one. A lot of people say, you know, my best buildings never got built. My best ideas never got done. Well, that, that man is only a part architect. 
you go across the hall, you'll see a man who got his best buildings built. He's an all full architect. He was what I think we have to do in, in some measure, and that is be more fully rounded in our ability to set the stage for that part of the performance which we can do better than anybody else. So, where do we go from here? I think we certainly have to be conversant with the new bounds of energy, uh, the limitation on design which this forces. We certainly should be thinking more of the functionality of our buildings so that we can produce buildings that really do work, really do work. First, they must work. Always they must work. Otherwise, they're sculpture. And sculpture is something people like to see and touch. But sculpture is not something that you can use every day as you do what you want to do. And I think the functionality approach is coming back much stronger than we've had it for a long time. It's got to be. It's got to be. And I think the schools realize this. I hope they're pressing this with you. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't deserve to be built because it works and shouldn't be built, and therefore this is going to change architecture. This is going to really take a lot of the wastefulness, the high style, the short-lived gimmicks, the stuff that pleases the eye, offsets some of the visual pollution, but never makes it spark as a long-term performer. The building's going to be more frugal, I think well as functional. Say nothing of the energy efficient building having a new look. And another thing that the architect will have to learn to do as 50% or more of his opportunity shows up in the public domain, he must understand the public domain. He must understand that before anything is ever built in the public domain, there is a political plan. So now he has to influence the political plan. Who can be more influential in the leadership position of influencing the political plan and the architect if it's a physical plan for buildings, roads, environmental improvement? You have to learn how to do this, and this is a very tough one, and you can't do it by sitting in your studio and drawing. You've got to get out in the real world, meet the people, find out who can help you to produce the idea that becomes the law that produces the building because more than half your work, young people in this room, will be in that domain in the next decade or two. Right now, if I were to say, how much of my work should be in the public domain, how much should be in the private domain, I said, if I had 60% in the public domain, it would be a good proportion of the opportunity, maybe not a good proportion of the qualitative work which I would like to do, because it's still distressed with all kinds of red tape and stupid processes, but you have to help to clean that up. That's the political plan. I think one of the other aspects of practice, which perhaps you uh, wouldn't be expected to gain in school, is the enormous diversity of the uh, responsibilities that you will have when you get out in the world. Besides being able to go to a zoning meeting and, and having a good command over the situation and project your ideas so that if they're right, the people understand them and they approve what you'd like to do, and every building you do today goes through the ringer on land use, you have to be able to do this. You have to have the time and the patience and the discipline to make an appropriate study of the use of the land so that you see the point of view of the people who surround you. That what you do is going to be compatible with what's there, and that you are not going to fracture a situation that becomes an ecological nightmare. You have to be able to do this. You have to write an impact study on every major work you do. You have to be able to tell the people, what is the effect of the building of this structure on this piece of land? Surrounding neighborhoods, patterns of roads and transportation through the area, 
now, believe it or not, what does this do to the employee-employer relationship in the area and in the region? And what does it do to the unbalance or the balancing of the various economic brackets of the potential recruitment that you can make in the area? This is a big one. That's a little more than the architect's been able to do. And then, last of all, you have to be able to show that if the building is built for this cost, it will have this kind of a life cycle maintenance cost, and it will be a good investment because you can afford to keep it up, Mr. Owner, and own it, and pay the mortgage on it, and it will have this kind of a flow out of it, and it will have this kind of a retirement posture, and it should have this kind of a program for obsolescence, debt service, and all these things. And if you don't understand this, end up being a draftsman for somebody someplace doing what somebody else decides should be done and you won't be able to make a contribution. So I guess some of these things you learn outside, some of them you learn inside. I learned, I must say, most of them outside. But never forget what you learn inside is probably the one thing that nobody can ever take away from you. And that is a philosophy in design which will carry you through all the problems. It's a method of approaching design which will get you through all of the sticky situations. And of course, if you do it right, it's a vocabulary that nobody can ever take away from you because you'll be able to express yourself in the second and the third dimension. So that's what you should be developing here, and I guess this is standard curriculum item. Uh, I could say in, in great depth what I would, would think the young architect of uh, tomorrow will have to do to survive for the profession to maintain a strong posture in the real world of tomorrow. And I've written it down. I'm not going to bother to go through it. I'll just give you a copy of this anybody's interested in my thoughts on some of these additional and more in-depth concerns, it's all written out here for you. I would like to uh, mark some of these points of view with a few pictures. No architect can really operate without his graphics. Can you all hear me all right in the back? Good. Can I have that machinery and a little less light on me and more on the machine? Good. You know, when I started my practice in Philadelphia about 22, 23 years ago, uh, I was In the, in the city, pretty close to Center City, in a little old carriage house that I rented and finally bought, and Penn Center was opening up. It was the railroad tracks. And this is a rough model, which I made about 20 years ago. It's, it's been updated. You can tell the cardboard coloration. You know how cardboard turns yellow when it's about 10 years old? Well, you can see the buildings that I did in it, some of them are yellow, but most of them are light. And it shows the historical situation that presented itself, because everything you see from the spire of City Hall with Willie Penn at the apex on to the top of this picture towards the Schuylkill River is a 22-year achievement center city. That was the railroad tracks, eight tracks wide, running through that area when I came to town to practice. And when I produced the underground plan and the transportation system and the fabric around which all of this was built. I never dreamed that I would get the chance to do most of the buildings in the plan. And it kept me pretty gainfully employed for a long time. This is the uh, IBM building in that complex. This is Central Penn Bank building in that complex. These are speculative buildings that had to be built to bail themselves in a period of 25 years or they wouldn't be built. Even though they had a proprietor's name on them, 
they were owned by speculators. And the banks that occupied them pay rent even today. They don't own the buildings, with some exceptions. This was a banking room on the second level in the central pen building with escalatoring up because the ground floor, if given back to the city without occupancy, gave us another six stories on the top of the building. And uh, the concept of open space in the city was probably the most favored notion of all 25 years ago. You just have to have more open space. Well, I've built more open space in downtown Philadelphia than anybody since William Penn, and I'm convinced you can have too much of it. So when I did this little plaza, which is right at the heart of the uh, city next to the city office building, which I did in the background there, I just thought I'd break it up. People don't like to walk across great big windswept open plazas, and our weather's a little better than yours out here. So I broke it up, and uh, the question of humanization, I didn't mention this in my precept statement here, but the question of humanization of a space by having room for people to back up to a wall, a tree, a fountain, or something is terribly important. And when you translate that outdoor space into indoor space, which this is between two of the newest and largest buildings we've done in the city, I decided to roof it this time. And what was an open court going down into the subway system has this floating glass dome over it so that this becomes outdoor space converted to indoor space. It's my experience has been you can have too much outdoor space that just kind of gathers candy wrappers and doesn't really serve too well. And of course, in this space, you can have some great excitement. This happens to be a four-level commercial gallery that rings the court between two high-rise buildings and descends into the subway system below. Now this space, this outdoor space, that I started to break it up a little bit here, populated by pigeons at the moment, but believe me, it's shared by many, many people. And during the lunch hour, it's loaded with people using the outdoors. And looking out upon these spaces through their large windows, I hope we can continue to have some large windows at the bottom of our buildings to give the street scene some life. We have a Gerard's banking room and a very pleasant disposition indeed that it has to the surrounding cityscape. But the principal uh, thing I've discovered about people in outdoor spaces is shown in this picture, which is a series of steps leading to a fountain and a whole series of small, cozy, little pocketed spaces where people can retreat from the great rush of the city streets. Police don't like this. They say, we can't drive by in a scribe car and see what's going on. I said, well, if you want to make that the primary rule for design, uh, you might as well just pave the whole place with asphalt, and then you can see everything, and uh, there won't be any people on it anyway. But this is a tough problem in this city. It's a question of security, security, security. It annoys me enormously that some of our most attractive opportunities are foreclosed by this horror of security. This is very unsecure for the wayward wanderer after dark. But in the daytime, it's populated. Believe me, people come from all over the area, and they really use it, even in the fall with their coats on, and right up until the fountain closes down in the winter. There's something about the humanization of the urban scene that is, I think, the secret to making people like to be in the city and come back to the city. And in the rush of post-war city building, the automobile, the subway, 
the skyscraper, the storefronts, the shops, taken care of very well. But this little oasis of life which makes everything come alive was completely forgotten, and I'm so glad we had a chance to do a few of these in my town because this really does add that kind of life. And it's not big. This whole plaza, the most successful one I've done, is only about 60,000 square feet. That's about an acre and a half. And I've seen as many as 70,000 people jamming this place to hear a concert or to see a, this balloon going up in the air, for instance, during the lunch lunchtime. So we are interested in this. Now, as much as the opportunity has been in the city, so the opportunity in suburbia has been enormous. And this is a project for which the pre-planning, the pre-conceptual work took longer than the construction of the building and the design of the building. This is on a piece of rural countryside facing on the reservoir in a northern New Jersey uh, town near Morristown, if you know where that is and occupied by a very large institutional user, the Bell Telephone Company's new world headquarters, so to speak. What are the problems? Well, first of all, not a single parking lot is, is to be permitted. I mean, I decided this without the owner deciding it or ever going to the local zoning board and the land use people because I knew the water that ran off that parking lot would have oil in it. You couldn't get rid of it. And besides, all that water would end up in these this little pond which feeds the reservoir that feeds the people for a town of about 60,000 right downstream of it. Now, what do we do about roof water from the buildings? You can't let that go in that reservoir. So it had to be funded in an impounding basin which lets it trickle back into the ground slowly. The automobiles are parked underneath this building. Since it is in a very rural, low-density, residential, farm and horse country kind of environment, you've got to be low. If you put something up in the air that became the principal physical skyscape piece of scenery for 50 miles around, you, you would be given the the countryside, a, a visual blight. But some of the other things, of course, involve the very nature of the building, which tries to be low and easy and spreading and doesn't disturb the ground any more than absolutely has to. We even had to build a bridge to get the people into it so that there wouldn't be a traffic problem with the main highway that runs by the property. And this was a great consequence. But the building itself rolls into some existing tree stands, which we saved at great expense and great care, but it also lives with the groundswell of some land that wasn't farmed and rolls with the ground. And it also takes the courtyards for the parking right down to the lowest level of the garage so that people who are afraid of parking in a subterranean piece of sewer pipe can uh, feel some sun and some light coming down into the space where they leave their car. And the point of view on this, of course, which I made was that the automobile is the last, really one of the last bits of freedom that American people have. They really love that automobile. They can get in it and go anytime they want to go and they they have an enormous pride in uh, their cars. The first car that the little secretary gets is probably the most beautiful car she'll ever own. When you park that out of the weather and it's dry and it's away from the heat in the summer and the ice in the winter, and then she can, she can know the day before what she's gonna wear to work, I really didn't know that dividend was in the cards, but really that's one of the things they like most about the building, is that they are protected from the weather. But this is out in the country, and isn't this a wild situation? Way out in the country, you have to build to the urban count of quartering the cars in the building. 
pretty big. 3,000 people. Pretty big uh, responsibility to do this so it doesn't shock the neighborhood, to do this so it makes the people who work in it get a fair shake on efficiency. It's a basically horizontal building. It works better than a vertical building. And the reason it works better than a vertical building, 100 stories high, which they would have to have for this building, has about 3 million feet in it. You would have 100 families with one common denominator, and that would be the elevator. The intercommunications of a big family of people in a high-rise building is zero. Maybe in the lunchroom. Now this building is a horizontal building. People see each other as they normally come and go to do their work, come and, come and go to get in and out of the building, eat, go to the library, and so forth. It's another one of the little courtyards going down <coughs> to the lower level. And this is what we found when we went there. And when we finished, there were more of these geese than when we started. And we were there for four years building it. This is the product of protecting the environment during construction. We had to build a great big barrier of evergreens between the construction site and the waterway. We had to take every single truck that went on and off the property and run it through a great big scrub pad and get all the mud off its wheels before it went out on the highway. Just endless amounts of protection so that the people who lived there before the building got there could be fairly normal in their lives, even though this big change came into their neighborhood. Another thing that the architect's concerned with today, if he's really on it, is the, the system by which a building gets built. It used to be that you could make your beautiful drawings, you could send them out to several builders, they would put a price on them, and the lowest builder would win it. Sometimes he was not the best, but at least you let the owner get the best pricing. The new way that's come up, we did this for a company to show them the difference in the time of completion under a schedule of designing, of well, fast tracking is what we call it, I don't know what you folks call it out here, where we fast track a building to a construction manager as compared with finishing the drawings as is shown in the upper diagram, and then the blue construction period starts after the building has been purchased by a raffle, we call it. Under the new scheme, we bring on board a construction manager, which is nothing more than a high-class name for a good builder who knows how to pro progress a job, work with an architect when he's developing it. The construction manager comes on board before the documents are finished, and he starts building before the construction documents are finished. And the work is priced by negotiation, not by a raffle. And you save as much as a half a year on a building like this, time, and time, six months, we did the arithmetic on this job, six months savings in the time frame on this building was worth $17 million to the owner. Now, when you show that to somebody and you really do the arithmetic and work it out for them, you have considered one of a client's principal requirements, that, he be, that you be fiscally responsible. So when we make studies, we look at this. Now, another, another way that has come into great popularity, and you probably won't see this in school, but we design buildings which are quite repetitive in their general nature. They might be uh, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 feet on a floor for an insurance company, let's say, or it might be a large uh, research center. But in any case, we write a performance specification for the internal environment of the building. So many foot candles of light, so many air changes per hour, certain tolerances in the temperature swings, certain tolerances in the humidity swings, and certain acoustical values, certain dB uh, bounce and certain absorptions. And then we say, okay, now you fellows go at it. 
and come up with a system, and then we build a mock-up of the system, and this is the mock-up of one of the systems that was put together by a company that federated lighting, air handling, acoustics, partition anchorage, ceiling support, and so forth. Now, it looks pretty busy, but it's very cheap. And I had a big struggle <coughs> to prevent the owner from buying this very busy, busy ceiling with all the parts and pieces and hardware and junk showing and still get a price which was acceptable to his budget. So now you have to mediate between the position of frugality and suitability. Uh, we did something in the middle of the road between them. Now we go up to the North Country where Really, the toughest problem is not air conditioning in the summer as it is in the southern states, but it's heating them in the winter. This building is to be occupied next month. It is a home office building for one of the big food producers out in Minnesota. Snow is standard operating procedures from around the 1st of November way up into sometimes into May. And the question of the preservation of this beautiful site, which is on a lake, is uh, a design input. Another one is the enormous temperature swings from minus 25 degrees with 40 miles an hour of wind to 100 degrees a few days in the summer with no wind. So the building is designed as, a, as an umbrella. The sun never really gets into it except in the calculated penetrations of these sky ports, which lets these let light down into courtyards. People don't sit right under that light and work. But the, the buildings are three stories, basically, and the commodity of light penetrating all the way through into them from these portals in the roof is uh, very pleasant inside. It makes the people feel as if they're working for one company instead of 10. And one of my major concerns now is that the efficiency of the building and its weather resistance and its horizontal pallet doesn't build a building that's too fat to be unpleasant. That's what the courtyard does inside them. That's not expensive. But it sure makes a difference. You notice there's a garage with a covered way that leads to it. The garage is tucked off in the tree so it doesn't really intrude upon this beautiful wooded site. And this is the way the building works. We use all the space under the roofs, either for uh, space in the building or for the mechanical equipment that has to pay us around it. And a good, generous overhang keeps the light out of the spaces. Now, we experimented with uh, the cheapest buildings we could do when we had to build for the Navy. This is a bachelor officer's quarters the specification was $3,750 per man. Didn't tell you how big the rooms had to be, didn't tell you how high the ceilings had to be. Yes, they had to be air conditioned, and they had to be heated, and they had to have windows. So we built a house of cards, which years ago went about like this. And the whole building was cast on the ground with plastic separators, nothing really so novel and new about it, except I did this 22 years ago. And it would be a very popular way to build today, but the trade practices have practically outlawed it. You, in order to do this building in 1976, it would take twice the manpower in the field that we use in those days, so therefore we don't do it anymore. But when we built this one in uh, Hartford, we put two city blocks up on four posts, but that space frame was assembled on the ground. And 
and all the plumbing went in it, and all the air ducting went in it, and all the heavy work that normally would have to be done up in the air on scaffolds was done on the ground, and then the frame was lifted up by hydraulic jacks, and these four posts were built under it. Uh, this saved, in the price of a $16 million coliseum for Hartford, Connecticut, just a little bit under $2 million. All that manpower worked under the roof from the ground on step ladders sometimes, but sometimes right from the prepared base. And it seems to me this kind of thing, which I think we felt was uh, necessary to get this off the ground, so to speak, make it possible to build it at all because the budget was so tight, started thinking somebody should have experimented with before we did it. We were going to raise this building in two weeks. And we ran into all kinds of funny difficulties, including wind. And it took us about, uh, we were supposed to go up six inches an hour with pauses for restaging, and it took us almost three weeks to do it. But it did work out, and it made a very satisfactory facility. And it's the sort of approach to structural design that we have to take. Now, in order to get some humanism in a building that big, this is where we go back to the crafting of the concrete work so that it does look as if it were placed by man instead of entirely by machinery. And this is one of my favorites now, is to place concrete so that it just doesn't slip off the form and uh, resemble a piece of coated plywood. Structures like this, which are all prefabricated, this is a little college out in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the whole building was built in a factory and shipped everything except the gravel on the roof, which came in trucks and carloads. But the whole building was prefabricated. All this structure was prefabricated. The brick columns were done. And, the, and this building also was built in a factory and shipped to the site and erected by cranes. There's no poured work in it. And yet, when you get inside of it, by the nature of these precast units and by the installation of a little light dome or vault at the top, we can get a building with about 80,000 feet on the floor and maybe 120 feet wide to have a heart that permits people to live in it, like it. If you didn't have that, those internal uh, areas would be 70 or 60 feet from a window, and that would be more than most people could take. Now these people can see their <coughs> co-workers across the court, 100 feet away, and they feel the commonality of the rest of the people in the building. But they also get a little humanism from the wood rail, the light coming in, general spaciousness that comes from a two-level uh, connector. Now, when we have to build a building for industry, this is an electronics, a microelectronics center where the implantation of radiographic circuitry on a sliver of silicon is, uh, is done for the Westinghouse people. We came up with an idea, since they were going to be growing by increments and they wanted to get under roof with the first three in a hurry, this is the first time we did a real big four-posted space frame. These are 60-foot square clear spans, and each unit has its, not only its own structure, of course, but its own heating, cooling, plumbing, and everything that that pod needs to work is incorporated in it. There is no central boiler house. There is no central chiller plant. In other words, it's it's an increment all to its own. And when the buildings are finished, these uh, little stacks which handle, well, this was, of course done about five or six years ago before the crunch came. And we were doing local chiller heaters in each of the units. Most fun I've had in a long time is uh, in the world of airports and travel, where the spaghetti that gets you there is really the bottleneck, although we still have a little trouble in the air. 
Airport of tomorrow, it seems to me, is going to be a series of garages facing the incoming traffic system, and then a mini carrier of some kind within the system to get you from one air airline to the other in case you switch between Chicago and Philadelphia. If you go out on Allegheny and come back by another carrier, you might have your car in the Allegheny garage, but you might have to pick it up after depositing yourself from a United airliner, and that might be a mile away. So we have a railroad system going through the middle of the airport, and it has front and center location after we've connected the garages to the airplanes. So if you go to Philadelphia, don't be distressed by all the mess we have. We're still getting there, little by little. I could talk about this for a long period of time. The main reason I show this is that uh, to build an airport on top of a going airport is a very difficult job. It's hazardous. It's a nuisance to the people who use it. It's an eyesore. It's the front door to the city, and it's like the back door to the cell bar. It really is a mess. So in order to expedite it, we prefabricated the whole building in a factory in New Jersey, and everything came in on truck beds, except support work on the ground here. And the whole building, concourses, waiting rooms, ticketing centers, baggage handling centers, the whole works was done by Derrick's and just picked them up glued them together, and here's the way it comes out. It's really not such a bad architecture, except I'll never be able to afford that much glass again. You know, if you can afford it, it's really neat to be able to look out and see the airplanes and see the incoming esplanade of, of people in cars. But it's not so, it's not so good on the heat bill. Now, here's a building which I did out in the country serving the uh, amenities of the place. Long, horrible battle with the residents to let them build this building, but now that it's there, and we've created the lake and saved the trees and drained it well, it got some good friends out of this one. I want you to notice the uh, treatment of this building for energy conservation. We are, first of all, conserving on that silly law that says every piece of steel in a building has to be cased in tons and tons of concrete to be fireproof or be sprayed with some kind of jipe which the workmen all dig off when they start putting in the mechanical system anyway. This is the first, first multiple story building in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania done in Corten steel without any fireproofing inside or out. No place. The whole steel frame is exposed. I will admit the ceilings for acoustical value do give you about a three-quarter of an hour rating, but the building is principally noted for its conservation of weight in the steel frame, the conservation of maintenance on the steel frame because it's core tends all it raises hell with the glass, that's another story. And the use of this high efficiency absorbent glass to pick up the heat energy before it strikes the building. Now, this is an experiment that I tried many years ago in using a veil of glass around the building to pick up the heat energy from the sun and then dis dissipate it by convection as the hot currents of air go up the face of the building and carry that heat away. And it works. It really works. I did a building in Virginia in which the glass is a larger percentage of the face and the hot air goes around to the cold side of the building in the winter and heats the building. I could patent this one because it really works. We've done a lot of after the fact and analytics on the effectiveness of this glass, and we wish that we had lowered it a bit. You know, the idea here, of course, was to let people look out of the windows and see the landscape of this beautiful countryside without <coughs> having the dark glass obliterate their view. And also, when that glass is dark, it's very reflective, and the building gets very dead, and you never see inside of it, except maybe at night when the janitors are cleaning it and the lights are on, you might see inside it a little bit. And this, to me, is a very poisonous kind of architecture. If you reflect something in it, 
like beautiful seascapes, I guess you could get away with it. Or if you reflect some of the ancient monuments of a city in a glassy mirror building, you can get away with it. But a building like this has to grow. And now, under the pressures of producing twice the building, doubling the building, and a very economical base, the builder came in and said, why, we can build that addition for you, Mr. XYZ. We can do it for $30 a foot. Just get that architect off our backs and we'll do it for you. Well, the owner liked what we did. He said, look, why don't you work with that builder and see what you can come up with. So we had to put an addition on the building minus the solar barriers, much more insulation in the wall, reflective glass, and an internal blind that kicks some of the heat back out of the glass. And this is uh, probably the last we're going to look at here. I don't like to do this for a hour. This uh, shows how the cycle of architecture changes between uh, the first construction, which is on the right, which is sort of a good old-fashioned campus plan that we did for Monsanto Chemical out in St. Louis about 20 years ago, and the one on the left, which we finished about four years ago. The one on the left is completely interconnected. Internal courts are built up tightly. Uh, automobiles are structured. The one on the right is a series of pavilions walking across the landscape, cars parked all over the place. The last one we did was a mirror glass building. Now, of course, you have to have a sponsor to do this, also a big stick at your rear end. This is the product of the company. They make the chemistry for the glass business. So Vince, you gotta give us a glass building. We like those mirror glass buildings. Just so long as you don't reflect the sun in the eyes of the highway drivers on Lindbergh Boulevard in St. Louis, make it all glass, and we did. And a building is a chameleon. It always shows something around it. It never has substance of its own. And for fun, for kicks, for a one time around, okay. But mind you, this is, is a growable plan. It has to get bigger and bigger. And the master plan, this only shows two of the five units to complete the plan. Now, you've been living in a fishbowl all morning. And there it is when it's reflecting the sky. And to the left in this picture is where you go for your lunch, completely underground. Gardens are on the top of that mound, beautifully landscaped. And under that ground, we have a dining room. And this is completely a rocks color type of affair. For the contrast, you can get between an all glass above grade situation and a relaxing, quiet environment below. Of course, this is reached from an interconnect from all buildings to this upper balcony level. And the only outlook is on a diagonal up from the space through to the outdoors by a little clear story at one end of the space. Another thing that the architects of the future are going to have to be able to do far more effectively, and that is to understand how space must work for people. I don't say we're experts, but I've got a whale of a lot of my time in space planning, finding out what job needs to be done, how often it must change, what are the physical requirements to set that workstation up, and how do people use it. I mean, the, the number of gadgets on a desktop today go all the way from just a telephone and an electric comptometer to a video tube which replaces that box on the left. No paper, no paper whatsoever. That insurance company I showed you has none of the paper handling of this space. And boy, it sure changes the events. Now, this, this has some of the uh, cathode tube replays in it. 
So you can do your work by recalling all the information you need from a central bank to a cathode tube, fire it back by a digital or a typing head, and you never see a piece of paper. And that's really going to make things clean, eliminate the fire hazard, conserve a lot of trees from the forest, and I think make life a lot more fun. Now we do a tremendous amount of work with the study of the interior and the rehab of interiors. This is the next step the architect will have to face, and that is in, in the place of new buildings, we'll be refitting old buildings, retrofitting old buildings to make them more efficient and more attractive. This happens to be a little branch bank that we produced inside of an existing building that was built 40 years ago. And it's really, uh, it looks out on uh, Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia, <coughs> which is one of our nice squares. And we just took what was a uh, broken down drugstore beauty shop next to it, and uh, the bank took it over and really gave us carte blanche to fix it up, make it attractive. And now, <clears throat> there are two turtles in that. You see them? They occupied part of a 2,000 acre property in Virginia on the Potomac River. And these box turtles are fast disappearing. Xerox said, let's pay attention to the local folks who think so much of this family of box turtles. And there are still some there in a water bed that runs close aboard the Potomac. You can see the Potomac in the top of the slide. You can see the Xerox University, which is all under one roof, footprint of about four acres, site area of 2,000 acres. I could very well have done a conventional spread around campus, buildings all over the place kind of scheme. But here we have the residence facilities, which are the chevron-shaped uh, roofs, which go down in the sloping form over from the crown of this hill for their bedrooms for the boys and the girls who go to school here. And then in the center, all under one roof, are two decks of teaching spaces of all kinds of description with all the new goodies in them, which only the, which only the Xerox people quite understand. And in this space between the residence and the center block of classroom areas, teaching spaces, is a three and sometimes four story street. It just ties the whole package together so you can go from your bedroom, which would be up on the left, into the teaching space on the right, down into the dining room below, or into a pool room or a dance hall or a pizza parlor or whatever you want. All indoors, very efficiently, very effectively, and then you have saved we calculated about 45 to 50 minutes a day of these people from running all over the place in bad weather. Time left over for themselves is outdoors on that 2,000 acres. Tennis, riding, walking, boating. And uh, I could spend an afternoon or an evening telling you about the curriculum storage facility in this one room projection center and a recall center for about 50 teaching spaces and they just broadcast out anything they need from that center to a to a student's bedroom in other words you can dial in your bedroom the day's lecture the previous day's lecture a continuing research in the field you're interested in or a good movie good entertainment well I can I can uh, I think I'll stop with that and I invite you to stretch your legs. Uh, I don't know that I could ever cover all the things I'd like to in one evening with you, but I would like to show you, not so much because of the enormity of these things, but because of the implications of the areas in which I've had to search out new answers, which you're going to have to do, even if you're just doing a house, and be ready to do that, or you may just be drawing in the back room for some big building company or some entrepreneur. That's part of my formal thinking. A little over an hour. Been a good audience. Why don't you stretch? We have some questions. I have time for 
the whole evening is for you. If you have any discourse you'd like to continue with, let's put the lights on and stretch our legs for a minute, shall we? have any questions? If not, we could, uh, uh, I think they're probably would prefer to have questions on a more informal basis. We can continue with the questions outside. We uh, really appreciate your coming here and making the presentation and uh, thank you very much.